You know when you're in a job interview and the interviewer asks, what are your weaknesses? And you lie and you say, so glad you asked me that question. My weakness is that I'm a perfectionist. I just need everything to be perfect all the time. Even though you and I both know that that's not a weakness. And the interviewer is probably thinking to themselves, you need to go back to the unemployment line if that's your answer. You know, you know when that happens? You know what, I'm actually here to tell you that perfectionism is a weakness sometimes. Yes, I know. Don't say that in an interview, but between you and me, I think it's an issue for creatives like myself and you as well because we're all creative. Mm -hmm. And if you think you're not, that's, a, that's an issue for another video. Maybe bring that up next time you talk to your therapist. No? Okay, well, moving on. Um, two things have happened lately that have gotten me thinking about the price of perfection, the pitfalls of perfection. Let's pontificate about perfection. Alliteration. Station. In the nation. I'm out of control today. Did I have some caffeine before this video started? I sure did. I sure did. The first thing is that there are several actors and musicians who have been very open about their disdain for earlier projects that they have been a part of, which has created anger, resentment, disappointment amongst their fans, their collaborators. The second thing that's been going on is that music divas like Beyonce, Barbara Streisand have released projects that have given us a behind the scenes glimpse into uh, their work, their process, all right? And how perfectionism has affected them personally. So, Based on all these goings on, I've come to the conclusion that there are two types of perfectionists. The first are macro perfectionists. These people are looking at their catalog of work at a high level. They're sharing that they're dissatisfied with something that they put out in the past. This level of perfectionism is extremely common given that most creatives have made things that they don't like. Then there are micro perfectionists People who are very specific about making the thing. The stage has to look a certain way. The harmonies have to be stacked a certain way. They're obsessive and unrelenting about creating the best possible outcome of what they're creating. At either level, perfectionism is not possible because let's say it with me kids, capitalism. Yes, which we'll, we'll get into in this video. Perfectionism comes at a cost to the artists themselves, their mental health, their relationships. But where does perfection come from exactly? Who is perfectionism's mother? Do we need to call Maury and do a genealogy test on who gave birth to perfectionism? Andrew, you are not the father. Is that what we need to do here today? That was a bad joke. That was a, okay, throw it away. We'll edit that out, okay. Uh, as I was saying, where does perfection come from? Why is it impossible to consistently attain? How do fans or the people who experience our art interpret perfection? How can we all form a better relationship with perfection? And most importantly, what does this have to do with the Virgo agenda? What I'm calling the Virgo agenda? Let's get into it. Let's start with the macro perfectionists. Actors and musicians like Jacob Elordi and Doja Cat have been more open with their, how should I put it? Um, how much they despise their earlier work. Their disdain for earlier projects that they've put out. Now, Jacob Elordi last year, he starred in films like Saltburn and Priscilla, but his first breakout role was in Netflix, Netflix, Netflixes, Acid Reflux, Acid Netflix. But his breakout role was in Netflix's The Kissing Booth, which came out in 2018 and was so successful, they made not one, not two, but three movies in the series. Jacob spoke to GQ Magazine in November, 2023, and had this to say. I didn't want to make those movies before I made those movies. Those movies are ridiculous. They're not universal. They're an escape. <sighs> oh, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> 
Well, as you can imagine, these sorts of comments lead to resentment and anger, disappointment from the people who still are fans of the work, from the people who you worked on with the work. And as a result, Jacob has received backlash for speaking out against the films. He had this to say about being called pretentious for these opinions. How is caring about your output pretentious, but not caring and knowingly feeding people crap? knowing that you're making money off of people's time, which is literally the most valuable thing that they have, how is that the cool thing? Okay, I mean, shit. Sure. And then of course, do we really need, do we really need to talk about Doja Cat and what she said? Okay, we'll talk about it. I mean, okay, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it. So Doja Cat tweeted this in May, 2023. Planet Her and Hot Pink were cash grabs and y'all fell for it. Now I can go disappear somewhere and touch grass with my loved ones on an island while y'all weep for mediocre pop. Um, and um, her fans didn't like that. No, they sure didn't. Uh, here are a few comments she received in response. I really love her, but to totally degrade your past work feels very wrong. Those albums created your fan base. Uh, this is kind of odd to say to people who have genuinely supported her, but what do I know? Doja Cat is allowed to make or do whatever she chooses, but this just seems like a slap in the face to people who liked her music. Please give your Grammy to the people that weren't making cash grab music. And scene. Fans are offended because they genuinely, genuinely, well I can't say that word, genuinely liked the early work. First of all, as a fan, you have to realize it's not about you. Creators often hate their early work and sometimes they hate the work they just put out, but that's a whole other story. They're just being honest about their feelings. An artist's inner critic is their loudest voice. I have almost quit making this video that you're watching right now several times. By the time the work gets to you, I've already said every conceivable hate comment you could leave on this video. I've already said it to myself. Basically, in conclusion, the key to overcoming criticism is to criticize yourself first. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. I'm just joking. Fans should learn not to take perfection from their faves as a personal attack. All the backlash boils down to one thing and one thing only. People take things too personally. Actors like Jacob Elordi are holding themselves to a high standard that cannot consistently be achieved because of capitalism. In other words, things have to make money. The reality is many of us choose to do things we don't wanna do because we wanna get our foot through the door, so to speak, or, you know, we have bills to pay. Uncle Sam doesn't care if the jobs we're being offered a don't speak to us creatively, all right? Celebrities are no exception to this rule. We've all heard the phrase artistic integrity, which according to Wikipedia, which side note, remember when um, we were in school and our teachers told us not to use Wikipedia as a source? Anyways, according to Wikipedia, someone who has artistic integrity is defined as someone with high artistic standards or standards of doing their job and that person's determination to not lower those standards. But the truth is maintaining 100% artistic integrity means sacrifice. It means it may take longer for you to become an actor who consistently works or an actor who is a household name or an actor that doesn't have to work one or two extra jobs in order to make ends meet. Not everyone wants to do that and I'm not gonna hold it against people who do. To me, artistic vision is not just about the art itself, but also what do you want to be the body of work that represents your talent? Both types of perfectionists, macro and micro, as well as really most or all artists are preoccupied with answering this question, whether they are conscious of it or not. Celebrities also have a vision of what they want that body of work to be, that body of work that represents who they are. What is gonna be their legacy? I think this happened with Doja cat too. Her past body of work doesn't represent who she is now and so she insulted her old stuff. Side note, it doesn't mean I approve of what she did, how she phrased it. Also, any of you who are creatives have probably found that being removed from a project for a while influences how you feel about the project, right? So when I saw the Mona Lisa when I was 12, I may have had one opinion. I may have been, I may have been like, it's just a lady. I could have painted that. <laughs> But now that I'm not 12, okay, I still feel like it's just a lady for real, for real, but I couldn't have painted that. My opinion changed as I got older. 
By the way, when I was 12 was not the first time I saw the Mona Lisa. I just was throwing out an age. Anyways, my point is the art hasn't changed, but I have. I like this video I'm making right now, but next week, next month, pr actually probably while I'm editing this, I'm probably at some point gonna be like, oh, this is not that good. Um, editing me, confirm that uh, with a caption or something, right? You see me, you see me, you see where we're at. But that's just the nature of the devil on your left shoulder and the angel on your right. Now, but what if I, yo, what if I was so good at editing, I literally had a, de a devil sh on my left sh and an angel on my right. <sighs> you see, you see what I just did there? Perfectionism. I know you didn't you didn't know what it was before, but that I think that really illustrated the point. Should I re-record this video with a green screen? No. Because that's perfectionism. We're not gonna let perfectionism hold us hostage. Artists can form healthier relationships with their inner critic through understanding that those earlier works, like The Kissing Booth or Planet Her, were a stepping stone to get to where they are now. However, even if they understand this they're still allowed to not like those earlier works or their current works. I mean, I didn't, I, did you like Saltburn? I mean, <laughs> cause I didn't. And that's your current work, so what's up? You know what I mean? But Jacob, if you liked it, that's on you, that's okay. Audiences have this relationship with entertainers where they feel like you owe them something because they supported your music, your TV shows, your movies, blah, 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 blah. And then they also like hold being rich and famous against you. So when you, you being Jacob, a lord, you're not watching, but you know, hypothetically, J Jacob, hey, Doja, hi. Jacob, I didn't mean that about Saltburn. I loved it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Priscilla, you you were great. You were great, Priscilla. Though you did you did eat that one thing. And Euphoria, terrifying. I'm terrified of you. You're the scum of the earth on that show. You you you're doing a great job there. Yes. So when you, as a seemingly rich, famous person, complain, quote unquote, complain, then you know, from the fans' perspective. It's, you know, you don't appreciate that I supported you or you're rich, so why are you complaining? Ugh. I think there's this weird thing in the world and on social media where people don't understand nuance. You can be rich and successful and still hate the thing that made you rich and successful. Okay, and maybe for some artists admitting that out loud that you hate the thing that made you rich and successful or kind of put your foot through the door. Maybe for some people that's bad PR, admitting that out loud, but it also, you know, it does highlight the cost of perfection in your career or your creative path. When money and fame are in the equation, perfection is not always possible. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking you dead in the camera lens when I say that. So now we've covered the category of artists whose previous work does not align with the vision they have for themselves. But what about artists who take us behind the curtain and, you know, give us a glimpse, give us a peek into their artistic process? Through these behind the scenes glimpses, a picture forms of a person who has a specific vision and will push themselves and their collaborators to uncompromisingly achieve this vision. These are your micro-perfectionists. How can we talk about micro perfectionists and not talk about Beyonce? I mean, I find a way to include her in every video I've ever done, probably, I think. Wow. Okay. Beyonce is also one of those celebrities who most often gets tied to her zodiac sign, which is Virgo. She is so tied to her zodiac sign that she has multiple songs where she reminds you that she is a Virgo. Okay, in case it wasn't clear the first time. And there's several YouTube videos that like get into Beyonce's Virgo tendencies and they all have titles that are like Beyonce being a Virgo for 10 minutes. Interestingly enough, understanding Virgos gives us an understanding of where perfectionism comes from. Now, I'm gonna keep this short because I know a lot of y'all did not come here for an astrology lesson. But you know what? I'm not about giving the people what they want. I'm about giving the people what they need. The main traits associated with Virgos is that they're detail-oriented perfectionists. Virgo is like the car mechanic of the Zodiac. 
Yeah. Virgos are auto zone. Virgo, auto zone. Get in the zone. Auto zone. They're good at breaking down a collective thing into individual pieces and then seeing the flaws within those individual pieces. This gift for analysis means that they can be anxious AF. They see the pros and cons. They made a plan A and they see everything that can go wrong with plan A. So they made a plan B, but then the backup to the backup is plan C. But what about plan D? They can be hard workers because they know what it takes to get the results that they're looking for. And they'll make the sacrifices to get there. If you were constantly thinking about the possibilities or the outcomes of something, you would be anxious too, okay? <laughs> basically behind that perfectionist facade that, you know, people stereotype Virgos as. Virgos can be anxious overthinkers who take pride in their work. They see the flaws outside of themselves and the flaws they have within. Within. There's too much uncertainty in this world to leave anything to chance. And so they know they gotta practice and practice and practice and practice some more and make some notes and not give any more notes until the previous notes have been implemented. So you see, perfectionism can come from anxiety and overthinking. And then, you know, to top it all off on that, perfectionist sandwich I just made. The way we figure out what is the best version of something or the best possible version of something is from gathering information. It's from experience, okay? It's from making comparisons. You didn't know a song could make you cry until the first time you saw someone cry over a song or you cried over a song. You didn't know colors could look like that until you saw a painting that combine them in that new and fun way. And once you see someone else display a certain level of talent, you're like, well, I gotta display equal or greater levels of talent. And isn't that how that works? We don't wanna be anxious that something could go wrong with our plan or that other people look at our work and think things are not good enough. So we need things to be perfect, right? Although we as creatives care deeply about the things that we make, um, you know, sometimes our collaborators don't share that same level of passion. They have their own standards of work that don't align with ours and their egos may clash with ours as well. As a result, performers can be vulnerable to people not taking them seriously or people trying to control them. For example, you know, I was hoping by the time I filmed this, Beyonce would have released the Renaissance movie. So I could have put a clip to illustrate this point but it's fine. I thought we were gonna put it on streaming. In the Renaissance movie, right, Beyonce had a moment in the film. If you recall, you can find the clip somewhere. I don't want to put it in because I don't want to get sued. Because she'll win. She'll win. But um, yeah, Beyonce is talking to technicians who tell her that something is not possible. I think it was a camera lens. Like she was like, can we get this kind of camera lens? And it was like, actually, no, we can't. And she was like, actually, I Googled it. G-O-O-G-L-E. And uh, Google said it was possible. So. I believe the quote from the movie is, eventually they realize this lady will not give up. Now, uh, someone who holds to their vision can be accused of being a perfectionist, even though they're really just standing on business, as the kids would say. Artists like Barbara Streisand exemplify this point. She recently released her memoir titled, My Name is Barbara. In a review of the memoir from Slate.com writer, Imogen West Knights writes, the portrait of Streisand that comes through in this mem. In a review from Slate.com, writer Imogen West Knights writes, the portrait of Streisand that comes through in this memoir is one of someone who needs and demands creative control of her work. She micromanages her albums, her TV specials, her films. It kills more than one of her relationships, her obsession with her work. 
but she chooses the work. I guess this is what culture does to women artists who are too good at what they do, call them difficult. While shooting Yentl, rumors go round in the press that she's demanding and difficult to work with. In the memoir, she also writes of an experience she had during her first Broadway role in the musical, I Can Get It For You Wholesale, where she clashed with the director, Arthur Lorenz, over the song, Miss Marmelstein, Miss Marmelstein, I don't know how you say it. I should have looked up. Let me look up how that song goes, actually. I looked it up, it's Miss Marmelstein. You look how imperfectionist that was. Barbara wanted to perform the song Miss Marmelstein while sitting in a rolling chair, but the director, Lorenz, disagreed. Eventually, he agreed to let her do the song her way, and she got a standing ovation when she performed it. However, the next day, uh, he yelled at her in front of the rest of the cast uh, until she cried, so. This experience made her realize that others could be threatened by her artistic vision and it could make them angry or controlling. Now, um, fans view micro perfection very positively, I think in general, because it means we get a higher quality of work and because the artist gets to do what they want to do, that work comes across as authentic. They're happy on stage seeing their performance come to life and we're happy seeing them happy. But for artists, this desire for perfection comes at a cost. It may damage relationships you have. Egos clash. Your collaborators want to be able to say that their way was the right way. In Barbara Streisand's case, she was an actor whose idea for the scene clashed with the director's idea for the scene. And in a situation like that, who should be the one to have the final say? The negative reactions you get from others or your own internal critic can ruin your mental health because you're constantly comparing yourself to things you've done, things others have done, others who are who you view as operating at the highest level of excellence. With perfectionism, you may always feel like you're chasing something. The work is simply never done. Elizabeth Gilbert is a New York Times bestselling author who has written about creativity. In interviews, she's spoken about how when someone is creating art, it feels like it's the most important thing in the world, but when it's done, you should release it. Ultimately, what Elizabeth is talking about, although she doesn't use these exact words, is the law of detachment. Now, what is the law of detachment, you ask? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Dr. Tara Swart, a neuroscientist, has this to say about the law of detachment. The spiritual law of detachment is about trust and surrender rather than control. And Shannon Kaiser, a spiritual author, adds, when you are no longer tied to the outcome of how it must be, you free yourself up to abundant possibilities. Now, it sounds crazy to say that an artist should become detached from a project that they have poured their heart and soul into, but the law of detachment is a helpful practice for artists and fans. You see, perfection is also tied to control, controlling the outcome of the final product. You can dislike your work, but it shouldn't be keeping you up at night knowing that something you did five years ago is like haunting you and is tarnishing your name in these streets. Okay, thinking that your first album or movie isn't good enough. No, honey, detach, detach. By the way, not saying that Jacob or Doja and them aren't detached. I don't know, I don't know them. I'm just saying for you and me. This is, this is advice for us, you feel me? And perfectionism, by the way, should also never be so strong that you never release anything at all because you're afraid it isn't good enough. Unless, you know, you personally wanna keep your art to yourself, that's fine. But if you want to release it, but you're afraid to release it, see, that's where, cause you're like, it's not good enough. See, that's where, <laughs> that's where it's a problem. Having some perfectionist qualities is fine, but you don't want it to tip way too far to the right to where perfectionism is controlling you rather than you controlling it. The macro perfectionist who reflects back on the path they took to get to where they are today may see imperfections. But because art is often a collaborative process and art in our society has monetary value, actors and singers cannot control everyone involved in the process of making and distributing their art, nor can they control how that art is consumed or interpreted. One of the reasons why people like Beyonce garner a lot of respect is because she seems to be good at maintaining creative control of her process and product. But even she conceded during the Renaissance film, which I would love to include a clip, but I don't wanna get sued, cause I will lose. 
that battle. But even she conceded that she was making more of an effort to have fun, to live in the moment for this tour. Okay, let's, sorry kids, can we turn back the page? Let's go back to that Kaiser quote I read before. When you are no longer tied to the outcome of how it must be, you free yourself up to abundant possibilities. The possibilities of having a good time, perhaps? Living in the present? That's why it's called a present. Cause it's a gift. <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt expeditiously. You know, I hate to say it, um, but perfection, perfectionism can rob you of fun. I know, I know, I didn't wanna say it. Uh, it's killing me, it's killing me. Uh. You obsessed over the outcome so much that you forgot to have a good time, sister. Dang. For both macro and micro perfectionists, the purpose of the present is to secure the future that they're obsessing over. And the purpose of the past is to learn from any mistakes they made so that they can secure the future that they're obsessing. And that's why it's important that we keep that little devil on our left shoulder. If there was a green screen, pretend there was a devil that I edited that in. That's why it's important we keep that little devil at bay before he gets out of control. We must zoom out and look at the bigger picture. Creatives, why are we doing this? To be miserable? I don't think so. So how do we end this misery business? A great song by Paramore, but also like not something we want to like experience. You know what I mean? Now for the fans, I didn't forget about you. Please come to the stage. I know you are, you're often staring at the stage, but I want you to come to the stage. Cause I'm about to tell you something, okay? As a fan, you, we really, cause I'm a fan of stuff too. You know, you know what I mean? As a fan, we have to realize we cannot control these artists. All you can do is control yourself. People are complex. They have a whole world inside them that we do not have access to, okay? Whether they're famous or not. So, although we may be disappointed in our faves for the things they say, if I like the work, I'm not gonna take it personally that they don't. There's only a certain amount of energy I'm gonna give to that before I'm tapped out, right? That, that dislike of previous work energy. In my case, I'm willing to make an entire video essay about it. Hours of my life scripting, filming, <laughs> editing. But you know, other than that, I don't care. So, yeah. So what is the price of perfection? Artists are perfectionists and on some level, so are the fans or consumers of their work. Perfectionism creates tension between you and yourself, the system you operate in, your audience, your public image, and your achievements, which means that ultimately what you gain is some level of dissatisfaction. You can't have it all, which is why detachment is helpful. For the artist dependent on their art, feeding their family, okay? Paying their bills, keeping a roof over their head. Maybe they have to detach from what their artistic vision is, at least in the beginning. For the artist who obsessively tweaks things to the point where they become miserable, maybe they have to detach from their work at an earlier point in the artistic process. And that, my friend. <laughs> And that, my friends, is the price of perfection. What are your weaknesses? And you say, <laughs> so glad you asks, 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 interview, and the interviewer asks you, asks, 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 I can't say that word. Ask, ask, asks, 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 asks. <laughs> And your interviewer asks you, asks, <laughs> let me start over.